Nutrition drives your stress response. I see this all the time in my clients. I see this in the kids. When we nourish them deeply and we give them more resources, they stop freaking out at the littlest things. They say okay to going to a new class that they were worried about. They sleep better. They're okay with like going to sleep, whereas before they were really anxious about being away from their parents at bedtime. Like really tangible things when we nourish that stress response with nutrients, they have better stress tolerance. We have this huge toolbox of nutrition to actually improve our stress tolerance that is, is often left untapped. This is Impact, the podcast where we explore entrepreneurship, mindset, and health to provide you with the ingredients for an unregrettable version of your life story. So after our series on resilience, I wanted to start a series on kids. And I keep trying to find the perfect way of putting it. I'm trying to be like upbeat and glass half full all the time. But where we've landed is that the kids series is going to be called The Kids Are Not Okay. And my guest today actually beautifully bridges the gap of these two arenas. And while our content in the next series and through resilience and in today's podcast is not and is not, is not meant to be and is not dark and gloomy, we try to keep it like light and fun and solution oriented. We're talking about big stuff. Social media just wants you to flick through everything that's perfect all the time. And our lives, frankly, are being conditioned to feature this outer view and glance of everything being perfect all the time. And the truth is, behind the doors of families, people are struggling. And by people, I mean the parents, I mean the kids. And and frankly, it doesn't even matter if you have kids, people are going home and they're struggling quietly on their own. And so I wanted to create a series where we were able to speak freely and openly about some of the challenges that we are facing as a society, but be focused on solutions, not lamenting the dark side of all of it. And so my guest today is perfectly poised and positioned to do this. Jess Sherman is a family health educator who helps busy parents ease their children's anxiety and improve their learning and stress tolerance. This is what we talk about today. We get into this notion of stress tolerance, because one of the things we can't control is our stress load. She does this by showing them how to nourish and support the forces that drive true resilience from the inside out. Alongside being a certified teacher, Jess is a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner. She's board certified in practical holistic nutrition. She is the author of Raising Resilience, the host of the Feeding Families podcast, and someone that I have had the opportunity to get to know, to call my friend, and to witness her passionate advocation for children's health over the last decade. Jess is articulate, she is knowledgeable, and she is a clinician. She is working and immersed with the children and families who are having to manage and find solutions to our stress load and increase our stress tolerance in the real world. This conversation is immensely practical. We speak to how we as adults can increase our tolerance and resilience to stress physiologically, mentally, emotionally, and it's easier than you think. We also talk about how we can facilitate that increased resilience and tolerance in our children. This episode is ruthlessly practical. It is positive. It is relevant to everyone. It is my honor and privilege to introduce you to my friend, Jess Sherman. Jess Sherman, welcome to the Impact Podcast. Hello, hello. So excited to talk about this stuff today. Well, we have we have some cool stuff to talk about. And I was just saying to you before we jumped on, the context was, you know, we're, we've been running this series on resilience, and then we are about to step into a series uh, called The Kids Are Not Okay. And you straddle these two pieces, which is why you're going to straddle these two conversations, uh, these two conversations today. I know you've got a lot to say on this subject matter. Before we jump in, share a little bit of your story with my audience. Why are you so uniquely credentialed and passionate 
to talk about kids and resilience and, uh, and how we can be better helping them out in today's world. It's a kind of an interesting sordid history and I'll, I'll make it brief, but I have always been interested in resilience, which is our capacity to grow in the face of stress, in the face of life, right? To just grow into our best sense of self. I didn't really call it resilience until I was writing my book, which I called Raising Resilience. Once I realized, I guess this was in like 2016 or 2017, that it w- what I was talking about was actually resilience because I hadn't called it that before. Prior to what I do now with functional nutrition, I was a teacher and I taught all kinds of things. I actually got my root, my roots were in experiential education. So like taking kids through experiences so that they could develop resilience. We didn't call it resilience. (laughs) We just called it growth, but that's what it was taking kids through experiences. We did a lot of adventure education. We did a lot of just shifting classroom environments and taking kids outside, getting them on the trails, getting them trying new things, and then helping them grow from those experiences. And I didn't just work with kids. I worked with all kinds of people. I worked with adults. I worked with kids with special needs. I worked with psych patients. I worked with people who were recovering from brain injuries and and all, all sorts of different people with the same idea of put them in, in different experiences, have them go through experiences and, and, and help them grow from that. That took me into the classroom. I taught high school for a number of years, and it was while I was teaching high school that that moment happened. (laughs) We all have a moment where like everything changes for us. And it was a moment where I was talking to our, it was a private school, so we had a headmaster, not a principal, but I was speaking with him and he casually mentioned that 60% of the kids in our school needed medication in one way, shape or form. So more kids than not. The statistics are maybe a little bit skewed because we, our school was the kind of school that attracted kids that needed something different and they weren't doing well in, in traditional schools. And so, you know, we had a fairly high needs population, but I was like, what, what, like, what is that? More than half of our kids. And, and it, I dug into it a little, and we, you know, we had this vantage point because, because the kids were living there. It was a boarding school. So we knew everything about them. We knew how they lived. We knew how they ate. You know, we were their guidance counselors as much as we were their teachers. And we had a school nurse who was dispensing all of the all of the meds, right? So that's how we knew so much about them. And so I think that was a really interesting vantage point. And they either needed meds for something physical, like they couldn't poop or they couldn't sleep or they had acne or, or uh, migraines or things like that, or it was something related to their learning or their mood or their anxiety or their, you know, their focus. And, uh, and I was like, I was like, I, what? I'm not okay with that. I'm not okay that more kids than not are struggling to get through their day without the assistance of some kind of medication. And I have nothing against medication, but it just spoke deeply to the state of things. It's a symptom. Right, right. And I had just birthed my first baby and I was like, oh, <laughs> I was like, oh, I have to learn now how to keep my, my kids healthy. And it's really interesting now to look back on it because I, at the time I was like, okay, I need to take a break from teaching. I need to do something different. I didn't take a break and study more teaching stuff. I didn't want more special ed tools or, you know, teaching techniques. I wanted to know what was going on inside these kids' bodies. And so I went the nutrition holistic health route to be like, what is happening inside these bodies that is leading to this kind of situation? And that's when I just was like, oh, wow, there is so much going on inside these kids' bodies. It's really amazing that they can function (laughs) because there is so much going on. They're actually more resilient than we thought. What is happening in their bodies? Well, you know, it's interesting. It's just this whole concept of resilience, like are kids resilient or are they not resilient is a really interesting question because we tend to be like, oh, kids are resilient. They'll be fine. But like, you know, you're doing a whole series and the kids are not fine. They are not as resilient as we think they are. And when I say that, I have to put a caveat in there because our bodies are incredibly resilient. Like they are fascinating. Our bodies are fascinating. We have amazing ways to deal with stress, to like these amazing feedback loops of what our bodies do to to keep itself in balance. And that is resilience. So our bodies are programmed to be resilient. But there are so many things that are being thrown in the face of that programming 
that derails it. And so symptomatically and functionally, kids are not resilient. But biologically, and you know, from a, from a programming sense, they could be resilient. And this is why I think we are at a real crux. I think I think we've been at this crux for a while. <laughs> and those of us in this, you know, nutrition world and and holistic healing kind of world, particularly with kids, have been shouting this for for a number of years, probably about ten or twenty. To be like, we are at a crest. But right now, like at post pandemic, we are really like at the at the turning point because our, the symptom symptoms are just getting getting higher and higher and higher. So, you know, we have the potential the potential to restore kids to their natural resilience. What is derailing that resilience? Like, what is what is currently pushing them over the the edge in your experience? Because like you're seeing these kids clinically. Yeah, I, I think it's a number of things. I think it's, well, I think it's two things. I think one is that their stress tolerance is lower than it ever has been before. And we can talk about why that is. And I think their stress load is higher than it has been before. So that's, I mean, that's where our work lies. We have to identify their stress load and reduce it. And we have to boost their stress tolerance. So what does that mean? It means, well, stress tolerance, like our capacity to manage stress is totally run by nutrients. When you look at the HPA axis, you look at hormones and neurotransmitters, all of those chemicals that make us feel the way we feel, those are all driven by nutrition. So there's work to do there. I'm just sitting here quietly because I want everyone to like fully appreciate that piece. It's not driven by how many meds you can take to mitigate that stress response. It's actually driven by the ingredients you give your body to be able to handle this on its own. Yes, exactly. Do you want a real specific, like for people who aren't practitioners out there, like a real specific way that works? Yeah. Okay. So, so neurotransmitters are chemical messengers that make us feel certain ways, dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, GABA, they're, they're just natural ch- chemicals. So our body has to create those. Our body has to build those. And the, the fundamental building block of them is an amino acid. And an amino acid comes from protein. So we eat protein. Let's say we eat an egg, which is high in protein. The body has to pull that protein apart into single amino acids. And then it takes those amino acids and reconstructs them with the help of vitamins and minerals into chemicals and neurotransmitters. So that's nutrition driving how we feel on a really like cellular level. You don't eat enough protein or you don't break down that protein or you don't have the vitamins and minerals to construct your neurotransmitters, you're going to end up with low neurotransmitter function. And that's going to affect how you feel. And and when we're talking about this idea of of we've, so we've got the tolerance piece we're talking about and I think people talk about stress tolerance all the time as adults and I don't think we actually default to it being a conversation around, around physiology. We think about it as like, are you good at handling your stress or not? Like we really actually only label stress as this emotional piece. We completely forget that we use up part of our stress bank account managing our, our physical health and our physical environment. But when you talk about stress load in these kids, same thing. We're going to have an emotional piece and we're going to have physical pieces. Can you speak to the, the breadth of that load that we as adults are placing upon kids uh, in the world today. Yes, that that is huge. And we need to take another pregnant pause, I think, around this idea that of what I just said earlier, because I think, like you said before, like there are some things that are just like truth bombs, right? I'm just like, nutrition drives your stress response. I see this all the time in my clients. I see this in the kids. When we nourish them deeply and we give them more resources, they, they stop freaking out at the littlest things. They say okay to new, going to a new class that they were worried about. They sleep better. They're okay with like going to sleep, whereas before they were really anxious about being away from their parents at bedtime. Like, like really tangible things. When we nourish that stress response with nutrients, they have better stress tolerance. So I wanted to belabor that a little bit for a second before we move into the stress load. Right. And I don't have any problem with that because I think we are so fixated on, you know, our own working definition of what this means that we're missing out on this massive opportunity, not just to help our kids, but actually to help 
and support ourselves because you, you know, you referenced your school, 60% of kids were on medications. Like it, the, the most conservative estimate that we can place in society is that like 30% of people are on medication to manage mood or anxiety disorders as adults. We are not inclined that way. We're actually inclined to be much more resilient uh, than we are. We have normalized this uh, externalization of, of management. We've normalized this conversation about, oh, it's just your biochemistry. Well, it is, but there's things we can do to have a greater degree of control and influence. And as we were saying before, this isn't about shaming anybody. And this isn't about blaming the person with the issue. This is about actually acknowledging that you, you maybe have an opportunity to have more control here than you have been told or given access to in the past. So. Because here's another thing we've normalized. Another thing we've normalized is life is just stressful. Life is just stressful. And you're like, take a yoga class, like breathe your way through it. And what I'm telling people is, yes, that is true. And we'll get into the stress load piece. But we have this huge toolbox of nutrition to actually improve our stress tolerance that is, is often left untapped. When you have kids coming into your, we're coming back, we're coming back to load everyone. We're just keeping you interested. But when you have kids who are, when you have kids coming into your office, what sort of commonalities are you seeing with respect to this stress load before we sort of define that broader, broader picture where you're like, gosh, like these quick tweaks and we, we can, we can get in front of this for kids. What are some of the themes that you're seeing in your office? Some of the themes are, uh, they're not digesting food very well. So a lot of constipation, a lot of bloating. They're just not so, so all of these wonderful foods that we're trying to get into them, they're just not efficiently pulling those foods apart into the building blocks that the body needs. I'm seeing sugar sensitivity in a big way. And, and sugar sensitivity is a really interesting one. If you, people who are listening, if you have a kid who is very sensitive to sugar, meaning like, you know, they freak out around Easter time, Christmas time, Valentine's Day, um, you know, all of the, <laughs> all of the things, freezies, all of the times we often give our kids sugar and they just like spin out. That's a real clue that they are carrying a really high stress load because our capacity to manage sugar is another one of those fascinating, resilient pieces. Like we are designed to be able to metabolize sugar and carbohydrates really well. But when our stress load is too high, there is interference in that system and we become very sensitive. And I suspect this is, you know, underlying, I mean, this is just a, an observation. I think that's underlying the whole like paleo movement and the fat and all of this stuff because what a body under stress typically does better on a lower carbohydrate, higher fat, higher fiber kind of a diet until we can help the sugar metabolism get healthier. I see that a lot. I see a lot of sugar sensitivity. I see a lot of sleep problems. Kids not getting enough sleep. Kids on, on screens really late and just interfering with their, their sleep cycles. Waking up at night also. Screens is another source of stress, yeah. Kids on screens is another source of stress. Like, we talk about this all the time. We're like, we don't actually understand how other parents put their kids on sugar and screens because our kids are psycho when we give them that comp like it is not worth the reprieve of having them quietly in the corner with like ice cream and a movie because they are absolutely bananas on the backside of that experience. And so like, you know, I, th I think people think we're like, we're, we're ridiculous in that we're like, we're, we're, we're limiting all of these these pieces, but like they're off, they're off the they're off the charts, and we're so sensitive to that um, when they are given that, and and that and like then there's like real sugar, and then there's like red dye number forty sugar, and that's like a whole other state of you know bonkers in our in our household. We just we just don't go there. It's not it's not worth it. Yeah, well, and it's a really that's a good little little test for people to to do. You know, like so sugar is a source of stress. Screens are a source of stress. So let's just focus on those. If you pull those out or one or the other or both, whatever is doable and see what happens because a lot of a lot of parents just haven't noticed because it's again, another thing that's been normalized, right? We give our kids sugar for dessert and then we go sit down and watch a show. So try not doing that. And I always I always suggest when parents 
we want to make a shift in something to give it, give it a, give a framework around it, give it a time frame, just to say, we're going to try this for a week or two weeks or a month or whatever is doable for you. And just get curious, just get curious, be like detached from the out- outcome. I don't know what's going to happen, but let's see. Mm-hmm. And um, it's a, it's a pattern interrupt. Mm-hmm. It's a pattern interrupt. And there's other ways of, of, of doing it. You know, if your kids are used to get, we did, we did, would do a Friday night movie night and we're like, again, they weren't going to sleep. Saturday morning was a disaster. It was ruining our weekend. And so we switched it and we're like, okay, we're going to, we're going to move away from Friday night movie night. It helps now that the days are longer. So we're outside, but like, they love watching formula one racing on Sunday mornings. I'd rather them have like the, the screen in the morning and then they can get outside and, and recover. So I think there's different ways we can sort of move these pieces around as parents, like, I don't know about you, but like, well, I'm not advocating that anything is 100% absolute, never have sugar again, never have a screen again. It's just how do we get a little bit more sophisticated in our deployment of these luxury items in our physiological life? Uh, so they're not having as deleterious uh, an effect. And maybe you maybe you differ on that, Jess, maybe you're like, no, like, no sugar, no, whatever. I'm curious where you're what your stance is. No, I think what you just defined is resilience, right? Resilience is is the capacity to weather that stress and to have a little bit of sugar and to be okay. And what I find with with kids is as we work on the pillars of resilience, like as we get the body functioning a bit better, parents are buying themselves wiggle room. And so all of a sudden, you know, the Friday night movie night doesn't turn into a disaster on Saturday. And you're like, oh, well, that's a good sign that, you know, res- the resilience of the body is being restored. You know, we can, we can enjoy some sugar together and we can all feel a little bit off for a, a little, a moment or two, but we come back to baseline mm-hmm. because we're, we've restored the resilience of the body. And so that's, that's, I call that process raising resilience because that's, that's what we're after. We want you to be able, we want everyone to be able to enjoy life and go through stressful experiences, but then be able to grow from that. And, you know, in family movie night is super fun. Like who doesn't want that? Right. And it's a connection point. And it's a time you guys can be all be together and inside jokes and family, you know, dynamics shift. And that's a wonderful thing. We want people to experience that. And, uh, and, and it's just, it just Sunday morning formula one is also fun. <laughs> I will check that out. We have not, we have not gone there. In our <laughs> I will check it out. So what has happened to kids in the pandemic? Why is it, is it worse? Is it just the emotional stress or there are more, are there more influences that are, are impacting the resilience of kids right now? That's a really good question. And, and it, it's going to take a while to unpack that one. I, I actually came across one really cool study that was done in Italy. I mean, here's the thing. What's going on with kids is worldwide. Like anxiety is way up, depression is way up, suicidal tendencies are way up, 51% higher emerge visits around suicide, suicide attempts. Like it is, we've gone up for just anxiety itself. We've gone up from about 20% ish to like 30 to 40% ish, depending on on where you are and how you define it. Uh, And so it's not just US, not just Canada, it's all over the place. So, but an interesting study did come out of Italy where, where it was looking at you know, the kids anxiety and response to stress as being very much correlated to the parents um, and very much also associated with parents. If there was job loss, if there was economic loss, the kids were much more likely to be anxious. So, you know, we do very much co-regulate with our kids. Our kids are literally learning how to respond to stress by watching us and by feeling our stress response. So that is a big deal. Well, we'll come back to us in a second. Okay. <laughs> I I think I think as a as a species, I think we went into this pandemic not so resilient. Mm-hmm. Right? Things were already not great with our health. We were not very healthy. You've talked you've talked about this quite a bit, Megan. It's we were not very healthy to begin with. And then, you know, this thing hit and just everything got worse, mental, emotionally and physically. So, and I think, you know, we're, we're going to be seeing the, the fallout from this for decades. You know, even the, even the collective trauma that we just all went through. It, we need to really think cautiously about that. We know how trauma transmits uh, through generations and it, it's, we can, we need to really, maybe we should come back to us because it, it, is, it is going to be us, the adults in the situation 
who are going to shift the tide for kids. Okay, so let's do that. Let's talk about uh, let's talk about the adults in in the room because I I think a few things happen and I observe this. You know, the the kids are not okay, so we're going to focus on the uh, we're going to focus on the kids, and I'm still just going to hang out here and normalize my use of medication or wine or excessive exercise or online shopping or whatever it happens to be, so I can just get through one more day. Uh, and I'll deal with me, uh, I'll deal with me later. And I think where we are both sitting right now is, you know, the, the health of our kids is actually predicated on the health of us as the adults uh, in the room. Uh, and we need to have a real talk about that piece, because it has been a challenging two years for us as adults. We're also in agreement that we did not walk into this uh, with our best foot forward necessarily with respect to, to health. And this isn't, it's not anyone's fault. This is a really complex situation with multiple dynamics, but it, it also can be our responsibility uh, and our opportunity to, to come out of it. So on that note, like the adults are also not okay. What's your feeling and sentiment and observation around this? Well, I think it's really, really time to tap into this nutrition toolbox that we have. If we want to stay off meds, <laughs> right? Because that's a whole other toolbox. It's not my toolbox, but it is a route that some people go. And it is a great, you know, crisis intervention kind of a kind of a toolbox. It's not my toolbox. So I think we, I mean, as parents, it's a great time to start learning about what food is right for you and making sure you don't skip meals and making sure that, you know, you nourish your body with real whole food and you just take stock of like where things are at in your pantry. Again, curiosity is one of my favorite words. Just get curious to be like, what, how, how much fresh whole food from the earth is in our home and how much packaged processed manufactured food is in our home. Let's just get curious about that for a sec because we all fall into it. We all fall into, you know, easier uh, convenience, what have you, because we like, we don't like to do hard things as a species. <laughs> we don't like change. We don't like change more busy. The path, of, path of least resistance. <laughs> so, so we all fall into it. So just get curious about that. But, but it is, it is a great time right now. If you as parent are feeling particularly stressed there is a, a chunk of stress load that is not yours. We are carrying it, you are carrying it, but it's not yours. It's the, it's just the stress load of the world right now. And it and it's stuff that is maybe being imposed on you like economic loss and the price of food and the price of gas and all of those things, stuff you can't do anything about. You know, that's, that's gonna stay over here. You can't do anything about it, but you can support your stress tolerance by feeding your nervous system mm -hmm. the food and the building blocks that it needs to function. I really like this idea of, yeah, distinguishing this idea of the load versus the tolerance and you can impact the tolerance. We're not immune to this. Like I had to have, I had to have a stern talking to with myself because I had gotten into this habit where my whole lunch was like a hunk of cucumber and a piece of cheese. And then I'd march back down to my office and carry through the rest of the day. And, and it was literally when something like this, Megan, do you think that this is an actual meal? And Megan, who doesn't do well with dairy, was like, ah, it's all I have time for. And we had this little battle. And so, you know what? I moved my schedule around. I was like, I, like, I work from home. I can, I can make the darn salad and stick some chicken on top. And sometimes we actually have to, we have to do that. Like, it's easy to slip into these, uh, it's easy to slip into these, these patterns. It is so easy. And accountability partners are so wonderful for that. I mean, if you can be that accountability partner for yourself, <laughs> that's even more amazing. A whole other conversation. I love what you just said, Megan, was that it was a very compassionate yet stern talking to. Yeah. Right. It's like, okay, I know you're busy. I know you want to make impact. I know you want to help a, like a ton of people, but you're not going to be able to do that if you don't feel well. On cheese and cucumber. Right. So is the cucumber and cheese actually helping you make that impact? Probably not. So compassionate yet stern. Absolutely. Yes. And it's interesting because uh, I know you and I both wear our, our whoops. Uh, I, mine is charging right now uh, upstairs. But um, when I removed cucumber and cheese as my sole lunch source, but mostly what the problem here was, was the cheese to be very clear for everyone. 
And I replaced that with a salad. I was like, what are other things I can do to increase, you know, my tolerance throughout the course of the day? So I moved the salad and I've, I talk about this a lot. I do my, I do my ice baths in the morning and I got back into doing my red light therapy and I really got concerted about, uh, when I did and did not have any wine and my HRV, which is like an overall measurement of physiological resilience and going up is better went from like 25, to like 54. Just by making these subtle shifts, it didn't take more time out of my day. It didn't cost me any money. It is like not expensive to get in a bath of of ice water for two minutes. And it made a massive difference to what my body could actually tolerate. And not only did I like see it day to day, but I like I saw the numbers. It is so interesting to be able to look at how this this data influences our own health. And my kids watched that happen. They watched me being less intolerant to them being kids and loud and all the things in any in any given moment. So I share this only because I think it's important. Everyone knows like, we go through these pieces. Like what, what did you have to switch during the pandemic? What did you fall into? I fell into the a very, very similar pattern. And I, and I still have to have that. St- we should have the stern conversation with each other mm-hmm. periodically. Yeah, we should. Because I still have to do that. Like Jess, is this, is this actually going to help you achieve your goals to not eat anything until three o'clock in the afternoon when you have an afternoon snack? It, it, they're patterns, right? Patterns are patterns for a reason. Patterns are your nervous system keeping you status quo, mm-hmm. right? So it takes a massive amount of energy to shift out of a pattern, right? It is much easier to just stay in the pattern, even if it's a self-destructive pattern, you know? So then you're, then you're stuck in a vicious cycle because you're like, I need the energy to shift the pattern, but I don't, my, you know, my pattern is to not give myself the energy that I need, right? So you get stuck in a vicious cycle and kids are getting stuck in that cycle as well. You know, and this is when I, I often will start with some, some supplements to just break, you need a pattern interrupt, right? If, it, if popping a pill, popping a supplement is all you can do right now to buy yourself some energy, make your, help yourself create more energy so that you can actually consider the possibility of making a salad every day because otherwise it just feels too overwhelming and it's not going to happen. And that's a great pattern interrupt. It's a great crutch. And eventually you probably won't need it anymore. Yeah. Cause ultimately we want you to have the salad. Ultimately we want you to have the salad. What are some of the things that very practically parents can put into place right now to start to increase the physiological tolerance of their and stress tolerance of their kids? I think the first thing we, we already talked about, which is just with curiosity, go open your pantry and your fridge and just take stock. No shame, no blame, just curiosity. What's in there? How much food is like real whole and intact and how much is processed? And then just start to make some shifts. We, I mean, everybody agrees that whole food is better than processed food so that there's no question about that piece. Right. Scientifically, I suppose. Well, maybe there are some questions, but we're going to just say there's no questions about that. Piece. For another day. For another day. And just start to pick one or two things. You're like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, instead of buying, you know, fruit roll ups, I'm trying to think of, uh, instead of buying fruit roll ups, did you say fruit roll ups? I was just going to say that. That's hilarious. Yeah. Instead of buying the fruit roll ups, we're going to buy the actual fruit. Or instead of buying the sauce, we're going to buy the fruit. So just little things like that. Instead of buying tomato sauce, we're going to buy tomatoes. Whatever is doable, like it's got to feel doable. Otherwise, you're going to throw your own body into overwhelm. You're going to shut down and you're going to throw up your hands and you're going to say, this isn't worth it and this sucks. So you have to take stock of your own energy resources and you have to take baby steps that are doable, but that push you in the direction that you want to go. And the direction that you want to go is more nourishment more whole quality, nourishing foods. I feel like that is a perfect place to transition where we're going because there, I mean, we can, we can start to unpack so many different elements, which means we're going to have to come back and do this again. And we're also going to have to send people over to your podcast where they're going to learn all the tips and tricks and tools and, and, uh, and, and deeper work that we can do as, as parents and, and for our kids. Um, but I want to transition to something I call our impact ingredients. And this is really where we get a sense of like how you live uh, your life uh, in the work that you do. So my first question for you, uh, Jess, what is like, what weird skill or talent do you have that people might not otherwise know about? You didn't see this coming, did you? (laughs) 
I did not. You are blindsiding me. Weird? Does it have to be weird? No, but it can be. Uh, let's call it uh, portaging a canoe on my head. Yeah, okay. That's pretty... Is that qualified? That's like so Canadian. Is that weird? No, it's not weird. I'm like, <laughs> that's not... That's not weird. Um, uh, okay, what's an, what's the biggest non-negotiable for you in your life? Bedtime. For me. What do you do for fun or play? Besides <laughs> carrying canoes on your head. Carrying <laughs> canoes on my head? That is not fun and that is not play. Um, I, I would, I'll put gardening in there, but only between the months of May and July before everything dies when things are vibrant and healthy that is fun and exciting but then you know things fall off the rails <laughs> I, I i just can't even imagine if you're like in arizona right now listening like why do people live in canada if you really have like one solid month of a garden before everything starts to <laughs> again there's there's lots to canada besides our epic garden season um as an entrepreneur were you born with it or did you did you learn to become an entrepreneur or were you born with it I think I was probably born with it, didn't recognize it until I actually started doing it and then realized that I was actually not employable. I needed to just do my own thing. I hear you on that. Uh, and last question for you, Jess, what do you want your legacy of impact to be? Oh, boy, I should have seen that one coming. Mm -hmm. mm, I want my legacy to be partly around my own children, because I think that's where I probably have the most leverage to help them grow into strong, resilient, healthy leaders. I live in a place of privilege. And so I feel a responsibility to leverage that privilege and teach my children about that as well. And then from there, I'm a really strong believer in the ripple effect of just, you know, that image of, you know, you throw throw a stone into water and it ripples out and that ripple just keeps going and going and going. And then we'll eventually meet another ripple. Uh, so I think that is my legacy is I will start from me and I will translate that into my my immediate family. And then from there, I I think of I dream of a time when teachers, parents, doctors, um, therapists, anybody who cares about children can really rally in their support to, to support their, their mental and their physical resilience from the inside out and the outside in, and really like take a whole child approach to helping them develop into their best self. I love that. You have so much to say on this topic. Jess, where can we send people to uh, learn more about your work and to listen to your podcast? Uh, all of the above. Where are we sending everyone? You can send people to my website, which is jesssherman.com with three S's in a row. That's kind of my home base. You can find everything from there. I, I'm most active on Instagram rather than Facebook. So that's just.sherman underscore raising resilience. My book is on Amazon, Raising Resilience. And uh, my podcast is called Feeding Families. And that's really all about exactly that. It's it's feeding families. So it's not just about, you know, the mental and emotional stuff that I that I work on with the anxiety and the and the learning struggles, but it's really just about the troubles and tribulations of of parents uh, feeding their kids because I want I want you to I want all parents to develop this unwavering confidence that it matters, how they feed their kids matters. So that's what we do on the podcast. Jess Sherman, you are amazing. I love the work that you are doing in the world to help uh, anxious kids and the parents of those kids. You've got so many incredible resources. You can find all of them over at meganwalker.com forward slash podcast. Jess, my friend, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Impact is what lives on when we leave the room, tuck them in, or step off stage. It is less about what you do, more about how you make them feel, and everything about how you choose to show up in the world. If you enjoyed this podcast, hit subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you are listening to this episode. I am your host, Megan Walker. Until next week, aim for impact. Impact.